Hear that? Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armor All, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every $20 you spend on Armor All products. That means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at ArmorAll.com. Armor All, less work, more clean. Terms apply. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my friends Julie and Reet Singh are joining us to talk about living the van life. So about a year ago, the Singhs quit their corporate jobs and hit the road to pursue their dream of starting a business and spending more time outdoors. Their website, tripoutside.com, helps nomads and explorers like themselves find outdoor gear to rent all over the USA. Thanks for joining us, Julie and Reet. Thanks for having us. How long were you guys thinking about trying the van life before you started? I think both of us definitely knew we wanted to get out of the lifestyle of corporate jobs, and we both loved traveling and mountain biking on top of that. So we definitely knew that travel was going to be a big part of something we wanted to do in the near future, but we didn't really know how. So it was probably about two years of planning on how to figure out leaving our jobs and figuring out what to do next. But the biggest decision to go with the RV was really our pets. So we had two cats at the time and we just couldn't decide. <laughs> we just couldn't long like leaving them. So we decided, okay, an RV would be the best decision. We could actually take them with us. We can mountain bike everywhere. We can be remote. We can work remotely. And, you know, it just really fit all those criteria. And we decided to do think RV life. If we didn't have the pets, I think we'd probably be starting off with international travel. Yeah, we had a a van for a year and then a pop-up camper before that, before we started RV life. And we just loved our weekend trips and wished they could last a little longer. So while we really did want to do the international thing, we also wanted to bring our cats. So we're like, let's just go live in our RV then. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, what was it about what you were doing before that that made you just decide you didn't want to do it anymore? Or or was it the opposite was it like the call of the road was just too great and you're like, we got to do this? Well, I was uh, in corporate America for 15 years and while it was a great experience and I learned a ton, I just really always wanted to start my own business. And when I met Reed, he also wanted to start his own business and we had kind of complementary skills. We both loved to travel and we only got 15 days of vacation a year and it just wasn't enough time to, you know, fly back to see my family and, and do, you know, a decent amount of traveling ourselves. So it was kind of two parts. It was like, all right, we want to travel more. We just don't get enough vacation currently. We're kind of over corporate America and having to sit in a desk from, you know, eight to eight sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to be able to work where we wanted to work and travel. Yeah. And you guys did a lot of trips before when you were in your corporate positions. I mean, you say you had two weeks of vacation, but I I seem to remember hearing about (laughs) a lot of great trips that you guys took. Well, we snuck in a little extra sometimes. We got lucky because it wasn't always tracked. So, um, (laughs) you know, if you're doing your job well and you're meeting your numbers, you know, you can get away with a little bit more. So, And the company and the roles we had were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we loved working for Home Depot and, you know, it actually allowed us to travel a lot in our roles. So we would tag on a lot of times a weekend trip on top of our, our work trip. So we'd work, you know, Tuesday through Thursday, but we'd take a Friday off. So that allowed us to really get out west a lot more and do a lot more trips. And that's maybe where the bug started is we started coming out west so much and loving so much of the travel and the writing yeah. that we wanted to keep doing more of it. Yeah. And that was sort of the seed for your business idea as well, right? You were going out on these trips and um, looking for gear to rent. It sounds like you guys did like a big canoe trip at least once or twice and uh, obviously bike trips and stuff. So that that was kind of the idea as well, right? That's exactly right. I mean, it's just so fresh. It was frustrating to one, do the research of where do you want to go rent the bikes, how close it is to the trailhead, what are the, what is the best riding around there. And then after you figure all that out, you know, you have to call the bike shops a lot of times, give them the credit card over the phone. And then when you show up in the shop, the experience was still pretty broken where you had to fill out a lot of forms. And all we wanted to do was on our tight vacation is talk to them about where to ride, grab our bikes and go. But you know, you spend almost close to an hour in the shop trying to do all the redundant paperwork that could be all done, you know, in advance. So that's really where, where Julie's idea started. I remember a specific trip I took with my sister to Arizona and we wanted to rent bikes to go rent a trail or to go ride a trail. And we 
tried to find a bike shop close to the trail and it took like hours of research to find a shop, figure out how we're going to get the bikes from the shop to the trail and rent it all. And when we finally showed up, we realized it was like 40 minutes from the trail, even though we thought it was really close. And we finally got to the trail and then we wanted to rent paddle boards the next day and we had to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always, I remember like going downhill skiing, you know, and like, that's the most excruciating part is like seeing everybody out there having fun on the mountain and you're like stuck in this rental line and it's, it's just <laughs> miserable. It's time seems to go so slow. I want to get back to talking about sort of how you guys prepared for this. So once you decided like you were going to do it or maybe before you decided and you were still researching it, what sort of preparation did you do before you finally made the leap and, you know, told your bosses you were leaving? Well, we did a lot. We had kind of several facets of stuff we had to prepare for. One was we did we buying an RV that would kind of suit our needs for the next year, which we researched for months. I remember re- being on Craigslist and RV Trader and all kinds of stuff like every single night trying to find the perfect RV. <laughs> and then once we got the RV, we had to remodel it because all the RVs are just even the new ones are just, you know, not not that nice looking inside. So we wanted to remodel the RV. We had to rent out our condo. We had to sell our cars. We had to figure out all the things about health insurance and mail forwarding. And then at the same time, we were starting our business. So I created this like huge calendar that was on like a big like poster board. And it had all these categories. And like every day I'd be like, we have to do this today. We have to do this tomorrow. And it was the only way that we could be sure that like everything would get done before we left. Yeah. Were there any surprises like early on when you first hit the road or did you guys nail it pretty much? I think we did a pretty good job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we pretty much covered all of our bases. We got our condo rented and, you know, we, we were able to sell everything. One thing, we didn't sell my car until the very, very end, like the day before, which was a little bit stressful. But we also decided to take a trip to India right before we left too, which didn't help with our planning. <laughs> but we somehow made it all happen. A lot of late nights. We actually planned to leave like July First, I believe. Yeah, exactly. And we weren't quite ready yet. So we stuffed everything in the RV and we drove to Reed's family's house and spent the night in their driveway <laughs> and like finished everything we needed to do. And then we left the next day. Nice. Just one night. That's pretty impressive. In hindsight, if we started to do that today, we'd probably be delayed a month. Yeah. <laughs> we just don't stress that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we started the podcast or, you know, we're calling this the van life, but you guys are actually living the RV life if we're going to be technical. And to a lot of people, it's the same thing. Maybe to you guys, it's like totally different, but describe your setup and why you sort of chose one over the other. I know your pets were a concern, but yeah, we'll talk about how you came up with the idea of using an RV. So van life was obviously my like dream goal because it just seems so much cooler, but the <laughs> practicality when it really came down to it, I'm so glad we're doing it the way we're doing it. So I guess the biggest decision that decided RV versus van was Pets and a shower, like a real shower. I had to have a real shower. I was like, I am not going to live somewhere permanently where I either don't have a shower or I have a shower that like is the whole entire bathroom and I have to like avoid the sink while I'm showering. (laughs) So I think those are the two reasons that we decided RV. You know, if we open the van door and the cats go flying out, that's not going to be very pleasant. Some space. And then, you know, the more we researched it over and over is financially it made so much more sense too. You can find like an older RV. Ours is a 2002. And the amount you spend on the RV versus the van is, is significantly less, especially, hmm. I mean, it depends again, like you could get like a $5,000 van and be okay. And you could remodel it yourself, but we just remodeling a van and making it into like a home just sounded like a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted something that was already a home that we could maybe spruce up and look a little nicer but not like, you know, we're not, neither of us are really that great at home improvement type stuff. So we didn't have the time or energy to put, to create a whole, you know, living space. Right. And accessibility, I think was really important to us to be able to get to trailheads and campgrounds that a van would fit in. So our RV is only 24 feet, but it offers things like we have like an eight foot slide out that goes out uh, three feet. So when you're parked, mm. it really expands the space. Mm-hmm. And you just can't do some of those things with a van. And we are fitting everywhere pretty much. I wouldn't say like every single place, but 90% or more of the places that vans can go and park, we are doing the same. So we've been on the Flathead River in Montana where it was kind of hard to get to. But as long as you're not too long, you know, you can get to most of those places in an RV as well. Yeah. I mean, if it gets to a point where you need four-wheel drive, that's obviously very different. And we try to avoid those places, but... 
you know, we haven't had a challenge of like not being able to get places that was their main reason for going with, with the van. Yeah. Well, I- a 24 foot RV. How big is that? Is that like mid size? That's actually short yes. in terms okay. of an RV. So it's like uh, F-150 is like 21 feet on average, oh, wow. you know, so it's, okay. you know, three feet longer than that. In a parking space, you're sticking out maybe three or four feet, but it's really not that much longer than that. Yeah, it's definitely one of the smaller ones. We've we've met up with a lot of RVers on the road and we're usually the smallest of the RVs. Interesting. So do you guys have tips for minimizing your vehicle costs, like whether that's purchasing it or maintaining it or driving it around? I think the number one thing is buy used. I mean, uh, we what we did is actually we did, before we decided to buy, we rented one in, I think it was Zion. We took a weekend trip to Zion and we bought, I mean, we rented, it was like 2018. Every single feature in there was practically the same. You know, they all have like same water pump, same fridge options, fr- even the front, the chassis part of it, mm-hmm. the Ford thing it had, hadn't really changed. I mean, really, and then we, we got a 2002, every single one of those features was the same. Huh. So cosmetically, they're not, I mean, you can really spend like $1,000, redo the floor inside, you can put laminate flooring, paint the cabinets, change the hardware, and it looks much better than a brand new one. And, huh. you know, you're not losing any functionality. And that's what was most important to us is value. And a lot of times the newer RVs actually have a lot of problems. And we've kind of heard that since we've been on the road and we're so glad we didn't buy new. It's not only is it like ridiculously much more expensive, but they have a lot of the same problems you would have with an older RV and sometimes even more because they haven't been like tested and driven. And if you get like a 2002, it's, we only had 30,000 miles on it when we, when we bought it, which is almost nothing, Yeah. but it had been driven enough that if there were any major issues or like things coming up, the previous owner had already kind of fixed them. Yeah. And you guys said you, you remodeled it. Did you do some of that yourself or it, it sounded like maybe you had somebody else do some of that? It was a little bit of both. Uh, we, We put some laminate floors in because carpet just doesn't work with our lifestyle. And (laughs) that um, that we had somebody else do. But we painted the entire RV white, which was quite a job. But it looks... The inside or the outside? The inside, yeah. But it looks so much better. And and then we did some of the other things. Like um, we put up some like sticky tile that looks really nice in the kitchen and the bathroom. And then we had our um, upholstery redone by someone else. So it was kind of a mixture. We did a little and we had we hired a little bit. We didn't do that much to the outside because it looked pretty good already. But we mostly just did the inside. And I think a big part of that was to make it look more like a home and not feel like you're living in an RV. Maybe we're trying to trick ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Do you bring like the little uh, pink flamingos with you wherever you go and like set those out and make it look like a house? Uh, we don't do as much as we should, but we do have a little mat and chairs. <laughs> yeah. And cool. I think one other thing for, sorry, for cost is important is just fuel cost. So we did look at diesel RVs. They're starting, like, I think there's only like one company that really makes it on uh, Mercedes chassis. And those start around like 35,000. And we got ours for 19. Oh, wow. So when you really think about the incremental cost of like how much money you're going to save based on the number of miles you'll drive, it wasn't even close. And that's and, used 35,000. Right. Those New are both used more. prices. Yeah. Wow. We've kind of talked about your setup and your vehicle that you're in. Describe a little bit about like what the living space is like and also how do you haul around all your gear? Sure. So our living space, we have, again, the 24 feet. We sleep in an overhead cab. So it's a class C. Uh, so for those that don't, it's the one you see rented most times when you go to a national park with a family driving around. So the overhead, it's got this overhang that comes over the driver chassis part. And Mm -hmm. that's where we sleep. And then we tow a Jeep. First, we started off with a trailer that had all of our stuff in it. And that was really great in terms of security. We had everything inside it. We had the two kayaks on the top. Everything else was inside the trailer. But the challenge was becoming that when we got to a trailhead, you know, a lot of times or a parking area, the trails would be further away or just getting around. You'd have to pack up your whole campsite and then drive to those different places all the time. Mm -hmm. So in January, we got a Jeep and that's been really great. We had the two kayaks on the top. We have a roof box and a ton of stuff inside the Jeep. And then the bikes were going either inside or outside the Jeep. And unfortunately, they were outside recently. And I think it's told you they got stolen in Reno after Interbike, the convention. But (laughs) <laughs> the, the next bikes will always be inside the Jeep or 
locked with like four locks on a, on a bike rack in the back. So you guys had your bike stolen recently, which was a big bummer, I know. And maybe you guys don't want to talk about it, but I know you learned some stuff about uh, how the insurance process works and everything. So what did you guys have any tips or things you wanted to share with people about that? Yeah, we definitely have. Um, it was definitely a big loss for us. And we it was probably our most valuable item in our all of our travels, <laughs> more more worth more than even our Jeep. So, you know, having them stolen was probably the worst thing that could happen to us. But now it's happened. And <laughs> we've been dealing with the insurance company for a couple of weeks now on it. And really what we've learned is, um, you know, we had a specific policy for personal assets. Um, and I specifically had mentioned that it was for the bikes because I knew, you know, if, if they did ever get stolen one day that, you know, that's a big chunk of money. So now that we're going back to try to claim on that, you know, we found out a couple of things that weren't told to us in the beginning. One was that they're saying that the bikes had to be stored inside the RV, which if you've ever been inside a typical RV, you know, that's a little bit ridiculous <laughs> Yeah, because we wouldn't even be able to move in the RV. So, you know, that's not going to happen. But um, the second thing was they have a way for you to actually list the bike on the insurance policy. And that was never offered to us either. And, you know, you can really just say, you know, it was a Yeti, here's the serial number. And if it's listed specifically on the policy, then apparently it's going to be covered at replacement value. So mm -hmm. we didn't realize that. And, you know, we're still kind of going back and forth with them because every time I've talked to them, I did say, you know, this, this is to cover our bikes. And I, I believe that really should have been offered to us because I didn't even know it existed. But, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're traveling and you have your bikes with you, um, really make sure you ask a lot of questions to the insurance people and, and specifically say, I want to list my exact bike on the policy so that it's covered in the future if anything happens to it. Yeah. And it sounds like too, I mean, if you're storing your bikes inside the RV, you don't really need insurance, right? Like nobody's going to come right. in there yeah. exactly. while you're in there and steal your bike. Like you can just grab onto it and be like, no, you're not taking this. Definitely check with them too. Cause they got into so many details about, well, were you parked at a campground and were you on a private property? Because sometimes they won't cover you if we were talking about the Walmart example. Yeah. They're just looking for one wrong answer to be like, Oh, sorry. Yeah. They say they don't cover you if you're in a Walmart parking lot and nobody ever told us that before either. Um, we weren't in a Walmart parking lot, but, you know, if, if we had been like, they would have just denied us. So, you know, we, there's all these stipulations. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that that would be like in the policy document too. Like it says you can't park in a Walmart parking lot. You got to put everything inside. Like, it's not specifically, but it does say, um, if you're not on like owned property or something like that. And, hmm. you know, basically they're trying to say if you're not in an RV park, but you know, you're not parked at the RV park 24 hours a day. So what about when you're out driving around? Well, yeah, I guess the, the only bright spot is you guys getting new bikes, right? Are you, you looking That's at, right. looking at an upgrade or are you going to go with the same bikes that you had before? Well, I want the same bike because I just bought it less than a year ago and I loved it. But um, it's it'll depend on you know how much we get back. Reet was kind of ready for a new bike anyway, so he's not as disappointed as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super excited to upgrade. <laughs> yeah, cool. When you guys are on the road, what is your biggest expense? Oh, I'll let Julie cover that because we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm the budget person. Typically, it's gas. You know, we uh, drive a lot and it depends on how much we're driving. Some months we've spent like over $2,000 on gas, but that was kind of a crazy month when we drove all the way up to Banff and back. But, um, I'd say on average, we spend like a thousand a month on gas. Mm -hmm. And then lately we've really been slowing down and trying to stay in one place for a lot longer. So and like this past month we spent like five or 600 bucks on gas and actually groceries ended up being more expensive than gas that month. So it just kind of depends. But, you know, if we have any vehicle maintenance and stuff like that, that sometimes ends up making it to the top. But um, we cook a lot. We don't really go out to eat that much. And so it ends up really being gas or groceries. Yeah. I mean, is the grocery bill sort of comparable to what you would have had, um, you know, if you're living in your condo still? Yeah, we probably spend a little bit more now because when we were in our condo, we were downtown Atlanta and we went out to eat a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> we're we're probably spending a little more on groceries now and a little less on eating out, but it's it's really not that much different. Yeah, that's interesting. So I want to ask, like, what is your week like when you're on the road? How do you spend your time and how do you balance it between you know working on your business and enjoying like the places that you're visiting? 
Yeah, it, it kind of is hard. We've really ramped up the business a lot in the last couple months. So the first six months of our trip, um, we were kind of waiting on the site to be developed and we had a little bit more free time. So we were just kind of going from place to place, biking, hiking, kayaking, you know, really enjoying our time off. And then um, since probably April or May, we've really been kind of hunkering down and spending a lot of time on the business. So now I'd say, you know, we spend most days, we wake up and we kind of sit outside a little and enjoy wherever we're parked. And then we start working for a few hours. And and then in the afternoon, we'll usually go for like a hike or bike ride. Not every day, but, you know, probably every few, like at least every you know, five, six days a week, we'll go hike, kayak or mountain bike or something around where we're at, just to kind of enjoy the outdoors. It's getting a little harder now that we have the business is kind of ramping up a little bit. So we're and that balance is always, and the days are getting shorter now too. So, you know, it used to get dark at like 10 o'clock. So it was great. Now it gets dark at like six. So we're like, all right, we got to fit something in before it gets dark. <laughs> right. But I think on average, we're balancing it really well. It's exactly what we would have hoped for. I think, you know, a good balance of you can't not work. You have to fund the fun. Mm-hmm. So, I think we have a really good balance and we're always conscious of making sure that we keep prioritizing getting out and exploring. Otherwise, you know, you might as well be in a condo. Yeah. Well, I mean, how does it feel like your time, you know, do you feel like, like it's time flying by compared to your previous life or do you feel like you have more free time? Like what, what does this, what does it feel like to, to live the van life? Yeah, I definitely feel like we have more free time. I think the best thing about what we're doing is that We, where we are usually parked is some sort of like national forest, BLM trailhead, somewhere close to where we can get outside. So we really save so much time in like having to drive to wherever we want to get outside because we're already there. So, I mean, we just, we do definitely feel like we have more time to like recreate outside. But one thing that's interesting is I thought we would have like hours and hours of time to be like reading books and doing yoga. And, (laughs) you know, that definitely hasn't materialized. I don't know where all that extra time has gone, but, um, but we, we definitely still find ways to pack in, you know, a full day and we don't even have a TV and everybody's like, Oh, well, what, what do you do if you don't watch TV? And we're like, (laughs) I don't know. We don't even have time for TV, even if we had one. (laughs) Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. One of the things too, I guess we skipped over in the expense category is parking fees. Are you guys staying at campgrounds and places where you, know, you pay a nightly fee or you have you found ways to minimize that cost? Every once in a while, we'll stay at a campground, um, but we do have solar on our roof. So the solar charges kind of everything in the RV that we need. And then our fridge is run off, off propane and we're, we're really self-contained, so we don't need to plug in, um, which was our goal because we didn't always want to stay in a campground. Campgrounds are nice because, you know, you can get a little break and you can run as much water as you want. You can <laughs> turn on all your you know, electric and it doesn't matter, but we really prefer to be like outdoors. So right now we're camped on BLM land, which is basically Bureau of Land Management. It's public lands. And there's typically some like kind of designated campsites with like a fire ring and sometimes even a picnic table, but it's free. And out West, there's a ton of it. Um, so there's a couple different websites and apps we use to find it or even word of mouth sometimes from different RVers or locals. Um, but it, it's free and it's on, you know, BLM, National Forest, just kind of like public land. And so that's really been amazing because not only is it an amazing place to camp with like gorgeous scenery and views, but it is free. So I'd say on average, we budget about 200 bucks a month for campgrounds, which is like maybe four nights a month. And sometimes we don't even use it. Wow. Yeah, if you're on the East Coast, you don't know what that even means because for years we didn't even understand that but that's i think the best part about being you know west of colorado or west of kansas yeah well what about walmart though i heard you can stay there for free you guys ever do that i think we've done that like four times total and it's typically on really long drives so if we're driving and we just need to like stay somewhere overnight we park we sleep we wake up buy groceries and you know take off but it's you know it's loud and Definitely not our preferred place, and safety again becomes some, somewhat of a concern. But I have a whole new level of respect for Walmart for allowing that, and we definitely support them in buying a lot of stuff there. <laughs> but it's great. And you're supporting mountain biking too because they build all the great trails in Bentonville, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah they're really putting Bentonville on a, on a map. Yeah, we try not 
be in cities for many reasons. I mean, it's hard to drive an RV in a city. It, stuff gets stolen. Like just it's there isn't much camping, especially free camping, except Walmart. So uh, we do our best to be in kind of more outdoorsy, rural, mountainous areas versus cities. But we do have to drive through cities sometimes. And and that's when we'll sometimes take advantage of a Walmart parking lot. And sometimes it comes in really handy. We were in, like sn- stuck in a snowstorm on I-70 and we spent a night overnight. So, you know, it's it's definitely one of those great places you can count on most of the time if you need to. Yeah. That's interesting, too, that, I mean, you guys are so focused on, you know, being in the outdoors and getting away from cities and stuff. I mean, that, that's a complete 180 from where you guys were before. I mean, you were living downtown Atlanta. Um, and, yeah, so that was a really big switch, which I think is... Uh, it's pretty interesting. So what is, what's the best part of living the van slash RV life? What's the best parts you've found so far? Um, I think really just the freedom and the access to the outdoors. I mean, just yesterday we were driving out of our campsite and we like looked to the left and there's like three huge bears just chilling on like this road and they saw us and they ran away. But, uh, it was so cool. They were like, I don't know, a hundred feet from where we're camped and I'm, I'm obsessed with wildlife. So I have absolutely loved exploring like Colorado and Idaho and we've seen moose and we've seen, we hear coyotes almost every single night howling, which is like such an eerie, cool sound. Like I open the window and I listen, I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And so I, we love being like a part of the outdoors and sometimes we forget like how lucky we are and, uh, then we look outside and we're like, oh my gosh, we should really be like not taking this for granted. We're like in the middle of a forest surrounded by amazing bike trails or hiking or whatever. Sometimes we're on a lake. Um, we've just gotten some really incredible parking spots. And I think driving versus flying to just before we would, I think it's definitely less rushed and you can explore so much more in detail. You think you've been in a place, but you, you know, we've visited a lot of places before, but we really didn't get to really know them. Mm-hmm. We, you know, you ride a trail, you go to a brewery, you go to a restaurant and then you fly back or, you know, you spend two days doing that, but there's so much more to an area. There's so many places that have local hot springs or trails that you just never get to even find out about if you're just doing like a rush trip. And typically before when we were flying places, you never really wanted to fly to the same place over and over again. Mm-hmm. So you only got to see it, you know, over a three, four day weekend. And we really just love exploring by car it's like the road trip is amazing yeah we get to see a lot of stuff you wouldn't see flying so we would fly before to like you know portland oregon and we'd see portland or maybe like somewhere within like an hour or two from portland but like when we got to drive from idaho to portland we saw Mm -hmm. so much in between like just little towns and like communities and like cool places of like middle america that we never really got to see before and that's kind of the stuff that we've really enjoyed i know you mentioned like we kind of came from living in downtown atlanta and now we're really enjoying like them more rural areas and it's really given us an appreciation for small town living and we've decided that eventually if and when we do settle down someday it's not going to be in a big city it's definitely going to be in a smaller more like rural kind of community area that has like a, a town that's big enough for us to you know live in and do stuff but still like super close easy access to the outdoors yeah that's interesting it's also the biggest surprise if you ask me if yeah what was going to be if I caught myself saying that two years ago, I would laugh at myself. But <laughs> it's like, no way. I love going out to eat. I love going to like nightlife and restaurants. And, you know, and I actually don't miss that at all. So that's been a, quite a surprising change. Yeah. What would have been some of your favorite spots that you've visited or, or stayed in on your trip so far? I think Idaho as a state probably sticks out the most just because it's just the most underrated. Everyone thinks it's potatoes or the confusing one, Iowa, but it, there's so much more to Idaho than, you know, just what you think, you know, I mean, just one, it's just a lot less people. So accessibility to every campsite that you want is pretty much open. You have mountains, rivers, you know, hot springs, small towns, and just a ton of really true wilderness still. Yeah. I think it's one of the last places in the lower 48 that still has like true wilderness where you can find you know, grizzlies, moose, wolves, you know, all the animals that used to be so many more places. So mm-hmm. we've just loved Idaho and we've got some great camping spots like right on lakes and rivers and just amazing, beautiful places. And sometimes we have the place to ourselves. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I think between that, there was obviously like expected places that turned out to be just as great 
as we knew that we were going to be. We spent a ton of time in Colorado, Crested Butte, Salida, near Rocky Mountain and Grand Park area. So those we knew were going to be great, uh, but I think the, the surprises were definitely, you know, Idaho and Montana and then parts of Oregon and Washington too. Cool. Well, yeah, we've talked about the best parts of the van life, but it can't all be sweetness and light. So when we come back from the break, we'll talk about some of the worst parts of living on the road. Stay tuned. You can't see me, but I'm wearing an awesome single tracks hat right now. It's actually the reason my voice sounds so amazing. Okay, so maybe not, but you never know until you get a hat for yourself. Go to shop.singletracks.com to find single tracks hats, t shirts, stickers, tubular headwear, and can coolers. Shipping is free within the USA, and your purchase helps support the Single Tracks podcast. That's shop.singletracks.com. And thank you for your support. And we're back. The question I wanted to ask you guys, and I'm sure a lot of other people are interested as well what's the worst part of living the van life? There's got to be some downsides to it, right? Oh, yeah, there definitely are. You know, one big thing is missing out on kind of friends and family. You know, being on the road can be a little lonely. Um, we, in our first six months, we really kind of experienced how it's um, not as, you don't have as much of a community as you had before. And so uh, we had to find ways to still like ha- interact with people. So I guess two things. One is that we, actually love the fact that we don't have to worry about vacation days anymore and we can kind of fly home or drive home to our family and spend like two or three weeks with them instead of worrying about like, oh, I can only come for a long weekend, whatever. So that's been awesome. And our family has even come out to visit us as well and come stayed with us in the RV or got in a hotel or whatever. So that's been really great. And then the second thing is um, we've kind of joined a couple RV communities out there. One is called Escapers. And it's part of a an RV club, but it's tailored towards people that are not retired RVers. They're younger (laughs) and they're working from the road. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. It's not, you know, you don't meet a bunch of people that are just kind of in their sixties retired and going down to Florida. It's Mm -hmm. more people like us that are younger, working from the road, traveling a lot, just going to see stuff. So we did a couple different convergences. They call them, they're like meetups. We did one in the desert in Arizona in the winter and we did one in Moab and we actually went down to Mexico with a big group too. And it's been awesome because we meet a lot of like-minded people that are, you know, traveling like us just because they want to travel and living out of their RV. And so finding that community has been really great too and helped us to, you know, not feel so lonely on the road. Yeah. I think definitely just be prepared if somebody's, you know, you're starting this is you're spending a lot of time together in the first three months, Julie and I had to like figure out how to balance that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, enough said. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's been amazing for a relationship though. In in one year we're spending like five years of marriage time together, right? (laughs) Calculate the time spent together. Uh, and then, you know, it's not, uh, don't let Instagram fool you. It's not just like this fun, easy lifestyle. It definitely takes work. You're always, you know, either maintaining the RV, checking your energy consumption, getting water, going to dump stations, things you just don't think of doing in your house. So yeah, yeah that's you're like, part of your daily lifestyle. How much water am I using to wash the dishes? Can I take a long shower or do I have to take a short one? And there's always these things in your head or even like having our cat with has been a little bit of a worry. Like how hot is it in the RV? Do we have the fans on or in the winter? Is it, is it warm enough for him? So that's, there's always kind of this like worry going on about like the RV that you don't always have, you know, when you're living in a home and all those things are taken care of. Yeah. And you guys talked about sort of the time savings you have in terms of like getting outdoors and doing stuff. But I imagine there are some things that take longer. Like I imagine cooking in a tiny RV kitchen is probably more difficult, maybe more of a hassle than doing it at home. Are there other things like that that you find yourself spending more time in? You you mentioned like getting water and going to dump stations and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And dump stations are actually pretty easy to find, but um, water sometimes is a struggle because we only have to dump like probably we we have to fill up with water more than we have to dump. So, uh, you know, going to like try to find a gas station or somewhere that'll let you fill 40 gallons of water sometimes takes some time. Uh, we don't have a dishwasher, so we have to do dishes every time we cook. So that definitely takes that takes some time. <laughs> takes up some some major time. And even just driving, you know, driving to find stuff. Sometimes when we're trying to find where we want to park, it takes, and it's actually kind of stressful, trying to figure out where you can park, where we're going to fit, what's level, 
you know, which way our door should face. Like you'd be surprised by the number of decisions we have to make. And, you know, that can be kind of stressful and time consuming as well. Yeah. What about connectivity? Like, do you guys have a hard time finding internet access where you are? Imagine you need it for your business. And also, I mean, we all need the internet. So is that a challenge? Yes, definitely. I think finding it is easy. It's finding it in great places where you want to be (laughs) is the hard part. Because we really struggle with that because we really want to be like in the middle of the wilderness or or very small towns. But, you know, the speeds uh, are... Location gets very uh, narrowed down by where there's connectivity, you know, and that's that's unfortunate that you know it's 2018 we're such a uh, advanced society, but we don't have internet everywhere. But. Yeah, it's good and bad. I mean, we'll we'll camp somewhere in the middle of the wilderness and we don't have any internet, but then after a day we're like, all right, we got to get back to like checking our you know website or whatever. Um, so it's been hard. We want to go off the grid and find these amazing campsites, but then they still need to have service. So it's always the struggle. Yeah. Have you been able to adapt like your workflow when you guys are doing stuff? I mean, your, your business is online, you know, it's tripoutside.com. And like, are you, are you able to like do stuff like you work on word documents and things and then like upload them later? Like what's kind of your workflow? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's been great. I think, and when we do work, we're so hyper focused that we just you know knock it all out in two or three days straight. Instead of you know, it's not this uh, getting back to every single email type of work that used to be. Hmm. So we can be off grid for two or three days and plan accordingly, which is great. We yeah. just took a week to go to Burning Man, and then it was great. Like we were able to manage it pretty well. Yeah, and there's definitely um, right now it's kind of a ramp up period. We're trying to get um, a good amount of outfitters and top outdoor destinations onto the site. So it's probably the most work we'll do for a long time because once we have them on, it'll be a lot more like kind of just run the business type stuff. But the good thing is we go visit outfitters and bike shops and paddle shops and ski shops wherever we are too. So that you know has been a piece of it. We'll, we'll even if we're somewhere that doesn't have great service, we can go visit an outfitter and, you know, get them signed up on our site. Yeah. So we sort of weighed the pros and cons of the van life, but what do you guys think? I mean, on the whole, are you going to get tired of the van life or is this something you see yourself doing indefinitely? Yeah. We started off saying like, let's try a year and see how it goes. And, you know, after six months, we were like, we love this. There's so much more we want to see. And so, you know, we were like, let's just keep going. Um, we rented out our condo for another year. So that was helpful. And then, you know, we, we really like what we're doing. I don't know for sure if it'll be, you know, forever. We're just kind of playing it by ear, but even if we don't like live in an RV for the rest of our life, it will definitely be a big part of our life. You know, we'll always have an RV and we'll always travel. Um, and you know, take trips in the RV, even if it's mm-hmm. not, um, you know, permanent. And I think over the next few years, we'll see, you know, we see ourselves taking, um, some short breaks, whether it's to go internationally or stay in one place longer and get a cabin, but, you know, we don't want to get, uh, try not to be too rigid on our decisions, but just be flexible with what's working. And as long as it's working and we're enjoying it, we'll try to keep doing it. Yeah, we have some friends who are fellow RVers and they take like a month to go down and live in a house in Costa Rica for a while and then they go, you know, live somewhere else. So that seems pretty cool to us. Like we'd love to you know, take a break and go live in India for a couple months, which actually we're going to be doing here coming up in January. We're going to go there for two months for a wedding and then we'll come back to the RV and, um, you know, RV again. The biggest concern is really our cat and figuring out where he's going to go for the couple months. But usually we have people that are willing to help out with that. Yeah. Well, man, I mean, it sounds like a great life if, if you get to take a vacation from your vacation. <laughs> I think a lot of people would like to be in that situation. Exactly. Well, and I think it helps us appreciate RV life more, too, because sometimes we can get like wrapped up in the difficulties, like the stuff we talked about just a little bit ago. And we start to like get a little bit down because like, oh, we're always trying to find somewhere to park and we have to fill up with water and we have to dump. And I think taking a break from it for a little while and coming back makes you really remember how amazing it is and appreciate it again. Hmm. So before we wrap up, I wanted to see what tips you guys have for people who are considering this for the first time or even for people who just got on the road recently. It seems like we're hearing about a lot of people giving this a try or thinking about it. So what what tips would you have to share with people who are getting started? I think if you've never done it, definitely you know rent one, take a week-long trip, get an idea. Is this something you can do? 
definitely recommend doing it. It's definitely a great lifestyle, but you know, it may not be for the the person that just can't manage the the nuances of doing it. So before you just commit, maybe just try it. And there's a lot of great ways to do that now. And you know, you try different types of RVs if you think you want to tow a trailer versus a motorhome. That's a big decision. So definitely try both of those and see how you like those. And then once you do start, you know, we definitely. Uh, if we were to give ourselves some advice, would be to stay a little bit longer in each place than trying to just drive uh, as fast as possible because you really get to mm-hmm. reduce your expense and get to enjoy it better. You get more local recommendations and you're not trying to just – I think at the beginning we were like, oh, we can be anywhere. Let's try to be everywhere. So yeah. you end up rushing a little bit more than you probably need to. It's but be- you know That would be the b- one big advice I would give is slow down. If you really know you're already going to – like a destination, give yourself, you know, a couple of weeks to really enjoy it. And even the places that you may not think are cool or never thought of, you may end up really enjoying your your stay there. So you're going to give yourself a little flexibility and allow yourself to stay there instead of feeling like you have to be somewhere else because you overplanned it. Yeah. Yeah. That was one thing we definitely did from the start is we had a rough plan of where we wanted to go, but not when. And we didn't book any campgrounds. We didn't book anything that would require us to be somewhere. Um, so that really allowed us to stay places longer if we liked it. And the one other surprise we had was that we liked everything. There were very few places that we were like, oh, let's get out of here. And there's so much more to explore and see and so many more amazing places than we really realized there would be. So we started off fast, like treating it like a vacation and then eventually just started slowing down because we realized there was so much to see everywhere we went. Some of the other things for recommendations would be, you know, like we talked about before, the BLM land. It's it's really, really great for, you know, not spending a lot of money and being truly in the outdoors. Um, there's some great apps like uh, Campendium and freecampsites.net. That's actually a website that help you identify these types of places. But and then also RV parks are are, you know, great. But we do only try to stay in, stay in them once in a while just to kind of charge up. I think the rest of the stuff we already talked about, you know, we we avoid cities because they're really not RV friendly, but there's so much cool stuff to see in the outdoors and the wilderness and the small towns. I think budget wise, too, you can make it as cheap as you want. So if that's your concern, you can really control that. So uh, I think what are, the, different people are going to have different hesitations, but make sure, making sure you have the right type of RV is is important. But not to worry because nobody's ever happy with their setup. Everyone is <laughs> always looking to improve their setup. So there's no, I think there's no perfect setup. There's things that work well with each different setup. Yeah. So don't let that analysis paralysis keep you from from doing it. Yeah, that's all really good advice. Well, thank you both for joining us and letting us know how it's going out there on the road. Hopefully we'll hear from you again soon. You can follow the Sings on Instagram at where the wild sings are and we'll share that handle in the show notes so you can click over to that and also be sure to check out tripoutside.com if you're looking for rental gear equipment uh, for your next outdoor adventure and finally uh, if you could give us a like on our facebook page single tracks mountain bike reviews that way you can keep up with the latest news from single tracks and find out about our latest podcasts So I've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week. Peace.